the July meeting of the Mountain View Computer Users Group. And today's major topic is going to be cloud services. And what we've prepared for you this month is something a little bit different. Each of the officers have put together their demonstrations pre-recording. Now, the advantage to this is it makes it much easier for us to demonstrate things because we don't have to fume and fumble. We actually know what we're talking about and it makes things a lot smoother. And the, but we still have the discussions. You can still ask questions, but we don't have to try and figure out how to get people back and forth to put stuff on the screen. So you're going to be seeing that. Now, here's today's agenda. We have user group business, which we're going to go through relatively quickly. A very interesting, timely tech topics. Tips of the month. This one's a little light this month. Um, but instead of talking about each individual system, we've got a topic that covers everybody and will be of great interest, especially for the viewing audience at home. And remember that all these presentations are available online through YouTube, and I publish them every month and send out a reminder. So if you subscribe to the MVCUG channel on YouTube, you will get automatically notified that they're there when I upload them. And then we're going to have the computer lexicon, term of the month. And then we're going to go into cloud storage services for some very interesting discussions. So, and then we have our Q&A. Um, our sponsors this month, we have um, Mia Bella Gourmet Products with uh, Carolyn McLean, the candle lady. Um, if you are in, if you're looking for candles, see her first. She's got some amazingly good candles. Pardon? Yeah. Um, oh, I found a way to get rid of the mosquitoes in the yard. Oh, it's fascinating. My smoker. I crank that sucker up and the mosquitoes disappear. As a matter of fact, uh, our neighbors next to us was saying, you know, it was commenting about the smoker because he can smell it. He said, ever since, whenever you smoke, there's no mosquitoes at all. I said, I can believe that. They don't come in our yard either. Smoking disappear. <laughs> this is meat smoking, not cigarette smoking. <sighs> yeah, I got a new um, smoker that is doing an amazing job. It's a Traeger with a wood pellet type. It's the best smoker I bought to date by far. What? Oh, well, I've done a brisket, um, spare ribs, um, spare ribs, yes, uh, pork spare ribs, St. Louis style, closest I've come to competition quality. As a matter of fact, uh, my wife and friends that were over for the fourth were commenting that maybe I should compete with them with that recipe. They said they were that good. Um, I didn't agree, but be that as it may. I've done pulled pork. I've done uh, a iron steak. I don't know if you've seen the flat iron steaks. Wonderful cut of meat, but can sometimes be very difficult to cook. I put that in the Traeger, and it was probably one of the best tasting steaks I've ever had. I was amazed at how good it is. Um, one of our other sponsors is John Buno Photo and Video. Um, available for all your photographic needs, regardless of what you think you may or may not need. Special discounts. I use this on the web. Oh, quiet, Siri. Um, sponsorship, $10 a meeting, $100 a year. You can slide during the meeting, post a video on the web, Facebook mention, ask around who knows who may want to sponsor us. Down to business. Okay. We have the officers. Me as the president. By the way, I am coming up for re-election next month. 
I don't think anybody's crazy enough to want the position, but if anybody would like to, you know, it is open to anybody to be president. Then we have um, Mike McLean, one of our vice presidents, who's but, and then we have Barry, who is not here today. Barry was not feeling well. He did a self test for COVID. He does not have COVID. I think he's got a cold. But to make sure that he does not infect anyone, he's staying home. Um, we said he is allowed to come into the city at some time this week. But other than that, he's not allowed out of the house. Um, God, I'm going to have to cut that out. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have Carolyn McLean, our treasurer, who has a treasurer's report, I think. We have $658.28 in checking and $725.26 in savings for a total of $1,318. Did you get anything from uh, Child Fund? From who? I didn't get the college portion, it's just my bill. No, I, I mean from uh, a donation from Bisbee? Okay, I'll have to remind them. Um, okay, so we actually have enough money to keep us going for a couple more weeks. Um, we have a webmaster, Jim Emmons, who does in fact exist. I got an email from him this last week. Um, now, we're not going to go through your introductions. That you all know who each other are. There's nobody new here today that I can think of. You all look familiar. Uh, some of our resources, we have our website mvcug.org, which is where you're kept up to date on everything that's going on. Okay, we also have our resources page, which has got all kinds of stuff up there, including quick links to all the past videos to make it much easier to, to find them. Because YouTube's user interface is anything but user-friendly. Um, Membership benefits, additional online resources. We have hardware checkout. Um, if you have grants, since everybody in here is over at least 30, the chances are that you probably have kids or grandkids or nieces, nephews, whatever, that if you're looking for something different to do during the summer if they're visiting you, you can check out our projector and have an outdoor movie night. You can project it up against a sheet on a wall in a patio, and you can get almost a 10-foot screen. It's, it's almost like being in a theater. And it's very easy to do. All you need to have is an, um, an HDMI input to the projector. And if you don't have that cable, I've got plenty of them. Um, you can do it from your iPhone, Apple TV. I do this occasionally when it's you know nice outside. We'll go out and I'll set it up and project it on one of the um, blinds that we have, and we'll sit and watch TV. I'm basically in mini theater. It works like a champ. Um, professional consultations. Barry and I do consulting. Say what? Yeah, HDMI. Um, yeah, it's an HDMI cable. Like, if you have an iPhone, you need to have an H a Thunderbolt to HDMI. If you have an Android phone, I'm going to have to research that one. I know it can be done. Thunderbolt is for iPhone. iPhone, right. Um, if you have a MacBook or a laptop, PC laptop, most of them have HDMI output now, so that's not a real problem at all. Um, and so you can go up and do YouTube. If you have most DVD players now are HDMI output, and that's what we did is we just hooked up a DVD player right into the projector and played away. Um, so uh, consulting services, both Barry and I, and on mine... I have it come back into the club. So whatever, you know, the um, and it's brought in, I won't say a lot of revenue, but 
Carolyn, do you have any idea how much it's come in for my consulting? Uh, no. At least a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. Okay. And it's $25 per household. Now understand that it was $20 for almost 30 years. Then we finally upped it from inflation. We may have to up it again because of inflation. This is getting ridiculous. Um, if you haven't noticed, gas prices have come down. They dropped almost 20 cents a gallon in a week, which I find to be fascinating. Um, I checked up in Tucson. Yeah. Tucson's almost a dollar a gallon less in some places. I was I don't know what's going on. Well, last I heard, Benson was down to 460. Really? Yeah. Oh, that <laughs> remind me, Gas Buddy. Yeah. I'm going to show everybody Gas Buddy when we get to that. Because mm -hmm. um, you don't have Gas Buddy, you're wrong. Okay, September through August. Dues are coming due in two months. So start saving your pennies and nickels and dimes and quarters. And just stick it away. That way it won't be such a great sticker shock when you have to pay dues. You can pay, uh, has uh, Marion paid her dues? Yeah. Okay, because she asked me that uh, how to do it. Because she was going to give me the money. Okay. Um, we have multiple ways to pay by a check, online, PayPal. Pretty soon we'll be accepting Cash App, low down Cash App, um, Zelle. Uh, yeah, uh, um, Wells Fargo is going to be doing Zelle very shortly. Uh, Zelle is a great way to send money, Cash App's even better. By the way, I'm going to warn you right now, within three years, almost all of your transactions will be digital. You won't need to carry cash with you anymore, either through credit card or just using your phone. Um, they, the infrastructure with the banks to do that is going significantly faster than they thought. Um, and the European Union is already there. China is already there. Russia is already there. And we are finally catching up with everybody else. Um, in China, the major cities do not deal with credit cards or cash. If you don't have a phone, you can't pay. They just don't accept it. Um, and it's very fast, very efficient. Um, we, when we were in China, we had our first, and they're implementing the same system here. Uh, in the United States, because of the way our banking structure is, it's a little bit more complicated, but that's coming. Um, we have this meeting. Next month is modernization, and I'm scratching my head on that one as to what exactly I want to show. But we're, hopefully we'll be talking about, um, Strides into smart home. Hopefully we'll get some more announcements on virtual reality and augmented reality. Because we're waiting for a bust. I was expecting when we did this last year that by this August we would have the major announcement we're all looking for. It hasn't happened yet. Um, we may have to change next month's topic because of that. And then September is the meeting that everybody looks forward to every year. It's my favorite meeting. It's when we talk about what you guys want, what you want to learn about. You get to tell us, say, hey, I want, like, I want tutorials on word processing. I want to learn about Microsoft Office 365. Do I really need it? What's its benefits? Um, what can I do in the cloud? Which is what we're talking about today. Um, so um, that's what we have going on. And... Jingle that Barry found. Okay. 
Up until this morning at 7 a.m., we had nothing for this month. And then all of a sudden, a major announcement came out that is actually quite significant. Most of you remember we talked about two months ago that Elon Musk was going to be buying Twitter for $51.7 billion. That's a lot of cash. Okay, it's a lot of money. Well, as part of the deal, he requested that Twitter tell him how many actual accounts there are on Twitter. Because that's significant as to the market share. And he's asked how many fake accounts are there, spam accounts. Twitter will not answer him. They will not tell him. So he's saying, I ain't going to buy. You have not kept up your side of the bargain. I just saw a headline yesterday that flashed by. It didn't bother me a great deal. Something like Twitter says that they delete well over a million fake accounts each day. That that could be. So there is a problem. Okay. Yeah. Because Elon said, you know, anything over 5%. The deal's off. There are estimates by those of us who have absolutely nothing to base it on that there's 20 to 30 percent that are fake. Um, that's why I don't bother with Twitter anymore, as I got tired of getting spammed constantly. Okay, so that's the news. Um, any questions about the user group? few seconds ago I didn't have any apps to share but I do want to share an app with you all before we get into our discussion topic and I'm going to bring it up on my phone this app is called gas buddy if you don't use gas buddy you're wrong now here in Sierra Vista it's not that critical. But in the major towns, like if you go to Tucson, Phoenix, anywhere else, it can save you lots of money. Let me show you what we get. Find gas. I'm going to click on find gas and it brings up for me, wow, prices dropped overnight. Okay, it shows me what the gas prices are of all the stations in town. I can do it by the price. I, I can show it by the deal price, distance, how far from me, by price. I can do it by distance. Uh, okay, the closest one to me is the Union 76, who dropped 20 cents a gallon overnight because they were at 4 dollars yesterday. Okay, I can say regular make rate premium diesel unleaded E85, whatever I'm interested in. I can say cash, cash or credit, credit only. And a significant one there is pay with gas, buddy. Now that's an important one, and I'll show you why. Okay, let's say that, ooh. Valero, it shows 479 strike through 466. Now, what that means is, is that if I get the Gas Buddy debit card and I use the debit card for that gas transaction, I get the gas at 466 a gallon instead of 479. Yes, directly to your bank account. It's a debit card. If you want to use this, okay, what you have to do is click on the deal and activate discount. And that activates when you use the card. If you don't have that card, you can't enter your credit card number. 
and it takes two to three days to get the discount. So you can use a credit card. It's just not nearly as convenient. Um, so this is, the, and let's say I want to find out, oh, geez, I'm going to go up to Tucson. Let's find out because we were talking about the prices in Tucson. Ah, at the, wow. At the Circle K on Tonka Verde and Kolb, it's at 437 cash. Okay, Sam's Club is 438. Costco's seen at 439. Actually, that's that, that's worth the trip to Tucson. Um, I can get 445 minus 18 cents a gallon at the Circle K. So this app is really worth getting. Um, now the price of it is a little on the high side. It's free. You can't get rid of the ads, unfortunately. But I use Gas Buddy probably as much as any program I have to find out. Now, to be perfectly honest with you, the I don't if it's within five cents, I don't care. Because on 10 gallons of gas, it's only 50 cents. So it's not worth. But if we're talking about 30 cents a gallon difference, yeah, I'll drive across town to get it. For one or two cents, no. Um, now, the other trick is, if you get the Circle K gas card, your first 1,000 gallons, you get 30 cents a gallon. Regardless of what the price is, 30 cents a gallon cheaper. From the credit, from the cash price. No, and from the credit price. So I use that quite often because it'll be the cheapest price in town by a long shot. But it's only good for the first 1,000 gallons. But make sure that you get it here in Arizona because not all Circle K's carry it. When I was in California and I realized we stopped in Yuma to get the card and no cards. They were out. Went into California expecting to be able to pick one up. California doesn't have that program. So we had to pay, unfortunately I had my gas buddy, which I was able at some times to get as much as a dollar a gallon less using gas buddy in California. So that's um, that's gas buddy. Now I believe you can get to gas buddy through Safari. You can get to gas buddy through the app. Find gas. Search. Let's try Sierra Vista, Arizona. There we go. So you get through through Safari. That's why there's no app. On the mobile phone, it makes more sense. But it is available through the um, Safari on your Mac. But you don't often drag your Mac to the gas station with you. Now, let's go on. Okay, now, the, the major topic, I'm gonna go to Mike first, let him talk about his Windows bypass login. And, the, you know, this is just a simple, uh, little tip that I use. I've been, I noticed I've been getting spoiled lately because my laptop there, this newer laptop, uses uh, a fingerprint for sign in. My Surface One that I have at home, that uses facial recognition. My old desktop, which is eight years old, still uses a login. And I get tired of having to stop and do a login. There is a way around that with Windows. By default, they always, of course, make you create an account, and you have to log in. The way that you get around that is go into the Windows search box and type N-E-T-P-L-W-I-C. That brings up the old network user account dialog box from previous versions of Windows. They have a lot of stuff still in there from old Windows that's really kind of difficult to get to. That's one of the things. 
And it's very simple because that box did, is where you can assign user rights from different accounts. But what you're interested in is there is one checkbox that says users must enter username and password to log in. Uncheck that, and when you uh, boot up, then it will automatically go ahead and log you into your default account without stopping. And I use that all the time on my desktop. So just a, a, little, a little tip because my desktop, I'm the only person that uses it. It's at my home. I don't care about security on it. If somebody breaks in and steals that, an old eight-year-old computer, I'm probably going to have other things to worry about. So, so it's insurance money. insurance money. So, yeah, that's just one fast way to, uh, to bypass that if you're not concerned about security on your computer. Great tip, Mike. Uh, I didn't even know. How did you find that one? Uh, it was through uh, some of these tips and tricks. Ah, okay. Because I, I never even knew about that one. I must have Run across it years ago because I've been using automatic logging, but I don't remember doing it this way. Yeah, um, there used to be a control panel, right. you could, uh, security control panel, and you can still get to it if you search for a control panel, and it'll actually bring up that old dialog box. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, next, we're going to talk about, and this is something that's going to be very important to everybody. It's not a long topic, but it's an important one. How much internet speed and bandwidth is really enough? All this, you know, keep hearing faster, faster, more bandwidth. How, how critical is speed as opposed to bandwidth? Bandwidth is how much data you can bring down. Okay. The, here is the rule of thumb. You need 25 megabits per second speed for each streaming device in your home. If you just have a computer accessing the internet and you are not streaming video or music through it, you need five or less. Okay? Now, if you are streaming set so speed, so let's say that I have I have my Apple TV, which is on almost 24 hours a day. I need at least 25 megabits per second. I have my Mac, my iPhone, my iPad, my wife's iPad, Mac, and phone. But how long are they on all together? So all of those together I'm going to say 10 megabits per second because we don't stream, rarely stream with those. So my rule of thumb is I need about 35 megabits per second to be comfortable. Okay, I was sitting at 150 megabits per second. I said, wow, I don't need all that speed because I'm not doing a lot of uploads anymore. I'm not doing a lot of downloads anymore. So I drop from 150 down to 50. Save myself almost $50 a month. Have I noticed any difference? The only real difference I know is upload speeds are slower. So I do see it takes longer to get something uploaded. Other than that, I don't notice it at all on the streaming. Now, but there's two sides of this, and this is data cap. How much data I'm being given. If you are streaming, you need to be, and you do not have unlimited data, then you need to watch your data usage daily. Because if you go over it's going to cost you. Now, I do two things at home that I need data for. I have cloud backup, which we're going to be talking about, which is what brought this topic up, and streaming video. Because of that, I realized, well, I didn't realize, I found out, I was blowing off my maximum data about two weeks into the month. And all of a sudden, Cox would come by and start charging me more. 
And Verizon would come by and start charging me more. I said, this is nonsense. So I got both unlimited data on both plans. That way, don't worry about it. Now, the Verizon does have a cap. Where if I go over that cap on unlimited, is it, they'll slow me down. Have I reached that lately? No. Have I reached it? Yeah, one month when I was hot spotting because Cox was down and I was having to use my phone as my internet connection. That, yeah, I did. Now, let's talk about your phone as an internet connection. Most of us are plagued with Cox. They're expensive. The reliability is questionable. But we have no real alternative anymore. There is one in sight. For those of you who have AT&T, T-Mobile, or Verizon, one of those three, they will be offering shortly internet in the home. For Verizon customers, it's $25 a month. No speed restrictions, no data restrictions that I'm aware of. That's a lot better than $100 a month I'm paying Cox right now. It uses 5G technology. Right now, it's only, according to Verizon, it's only available in Phoenix. Even though we have 5G down here, it's only available in Phoenix. If you have the next the neighbor app, next to our neighbor, there's been a discussion going on for the past week. Some guy claims that he's gotten it here at Sierra Vista. According to Verizon, at the store, down by Walmart, and where the website, it ain't here in Sierra Vista. So I don't know how he's getting it. But what you'll get is a little box that will replace your cable modem. And what it is is basically a Wi-Fi cell phone without the phone. And that's how you get your wireless internet. It'll come in, it'll go into your router, and you'll have it. And that's that's coming. It is in your home, if you have a dead spot, you can put a Wi-Fi booster in, and it will boost up that signal. It will not boost up what you have. Verizon coming in. Except, there are ones that will do that. If you're in a very low signal area, you can get a Wi-Fi booster that connects into, um, you can put it in your home, that will take the signal and boost it. But it has to be designed specifically for doing that. Verizon has them. I don't know if they have them here, because the signal almost everywhere here in town is good. Today, we've got much better technologies, such as 5G. Um, my, my phone on 5G is as good as or better than Cox. As a matter of fact, when Cox goes down, I just switch my whole house over to using my phone. And it works like a champ. Now, one time I did get Verizon complained about all the data I was using because that particular month, my daughter and I were both using Hotspot a lot. Well, that shot our data usage up clear out of sight. But other than that, we were good. So, that's what we have. So, take a look at what you were doing. You may be able to downgrade and save some money. You don't need maximum speed unless there's a reason for it. Speed for the sake of speed is not necessary. General rule of thumb is 25 megabits per second per streaming device. Okay, imagine this screen is my TV at home. I do the same thing I'm going to do right now.
There it is. That's my phone on my TV set, wirelessly. You don't see any wires, do you? It's being projected. I do that at the house all the time. When my daughter calls, FaceTime, I'll take and put it on the TV set so we can see her. And that's how I use both my iPad. Now, if you're going to be doing that on a regular basis, you should get a 4K TV set. Because the resolution on a 1K TV is not nearly is not good enough to substitute as a computer monitor. 4K is. That's the type of TV set. It's a resolution. Ultra high resolution. And they run what are they running right now? About a thousand dollars. But that price is going to be coming down starting Right now, I've been seeing the sales coming in. There's a glut of TVs, appliances on the market today. They all came in out of China at one time, and so they've got to clear the warehouses out. I'm seeing large screen TV sets. My daughter's been wanting to get a, a bigger... Her, her screen right now is about like this. Okay. And at her new place... You barely see it. I complain about it constantly. I was looking at a 55-inch TV for $139. That's not bad. You know, I can almost afford that. 8K, I haven't been looking at. 4K, I haven't been looking at. 8K, that's iffy right now. Is whether that's going to become a commercial product or not. Um... Is AK tech, and we're talking about the resolution, the detail that you get. The 4K TV, if you want something really exciting, go down to Best Buy and ask to see a 4K TV. Say so you're interested in it, don't buy it. And it is stunning. It is stunning. Okay, so let's move on. Yeah, Mike, speaking of scams, be sure and check your credit card. For an Uber Eats pending, that's the name of it. It's not pending in the credit card. It's Uber Eats pending is the name of it. If you see that and you haven't used Uber Eats, challenge it. It showed up on one of my credit cards. And it wasn't a credit card we normally use for Uber Eats. I thought, well, maybe my for some reason my daughter... I don't know why she would, because she just goes up and orders it, and it goes on the center. So I said, I mean, did you? She said, no, I have not used Uber Eats in a week. Okay, then what's this charge? So I got a hold of the bank, closed down the card, put inquiry into it, and, she, and then I did a search on the internet about it. Come to find out, it's a well-known Scam. I mean, hundreds of people reported it. So, and I got my money back. It was a bogus claim. And this, what they do is, so you understand, is that they don't have to get your credit card. They will go through and generate card numbers and on a site that does not ask for the date or the CVV code. And when they get a hit, that's when they make the charge to see the charge go through. If it does go through, then you can expect a big charge. I found this out from the bank because one time I was sitting there with a $5,000 charge on one of my cards. Fortunately, the fraud alert kicked in as I was filling up at a gas station in Las Vegas. And they turned my card off. I said, what gets? Well, did you just make a cruise reservation for $5,000 on your card? No, ma'am. Not at all. Well, it just popped up. How is that possible? And she went to explain it to me. It's getting harder and harder for them to do it, but it still can be done. 
Okay, moving right along. Okay, yeah. Questions, answers, we've already done that. And it's now time for a break. Okay, so everybody take a break. We'll be back in about five minutes. Okay, folks, we're going to continue now that the break is over. Now we're going to talk about our computer term of the month. And it's going to be cloud computing and cloud services, what those terms mean, because that's what we're talking about this month. Now, these are two different definitions. I don't expect you to try and read them on the screen right now. But when you're looking at these at your home and your leisure, you can sit and look at them. But basically, cloud computing is where you are working on a computer, not at your home. It's someplace else, and you don't really care where it is, because that's what the cloud is called. It's just out there. And originally, it was mainly storage. But that's not true. If you think about it, that we have been doing cloud computing longer than we've been doing desktop computing. Because the old IBM mainframes, the old uh, mainframe computers, we would all be remote from it. And we'd have to log into it. And we never knew where the computer was. It wasn't on our desktop. It was in some computer data center someplace. So we kind of got in a great big circle, come right back to where we were 50 years ago. Now, granted, the computers of today are significantly more powerful than the computers of yesteryear. My watch has more computing power than an IBM 360. Okay? An IBM 360 would take up this room. I'm wearing basically an IBM 360 on my wrist. And this is an old one. This isn't even one of the new ones. Okay? Uh, three years old? Four years old? Oh, that, but in computer terms, that's a long time ago. That's ancient. Um, but here are you know, the definitions. So it's basically remote operations. Originally, for the, in the PC world, it was storing remotely. That you had a drive out there that somebody else took care of and you could put documents out there. The World Wide Web brought it in because the when we go up to a web page, we didn't know where that web page was. We didn't know where the computer was. We didn't even really care. Now we have whole applications. And I'll be showing you those. And for those of you who don't know, that Apple provides word processing, spreadsheets, presentations, photo albums, all free to anyone. And you can access it through your web browser. I'm going to be demonstrating that. So if you have simple needs, i.e. you're not writing a dissertation or complex business documents, government contracts, Pages works just fine. And it's free to anybody. It's available as a cloud computing application. So, what are services offered? Well, here's a big, long laundry list. Um, talking about web-based computing, um, a bunch of acronyms, software as a service, platform as a service. These are all cloud terms. Don't worry about that. I just put that up there so if you ever hear a term, like if somebody says SAS or PASS, you have some place to go and look at what it is. It's cloud computing terms. It's basically that you can set up an entire PC on a machine that you don't own. Let's say that Carolyn goes out and gets a job tomorrow morning. She gets rid of her laptop. Or she needs a computer more powerful than her laptop is. Or she wants to start using her iPad. You can now, they can set up to where you have an IBM PC that is remote. You get it through the cloud. Those are called remote desktops. 
works like a champ. That comes out of the past. Platform as a service. I use these in my work all the time. We have different computers set up for different functions. As testing computers, as we go through and testing software. So if we break something, that it's a remote, remote, a remote machine that's not going to be affected. And that's currently available. Now, you only find it in business most of the time. But it is out there. And many of you see the web applications. Now, for those of you who do online banking, got news for you. That's an actual application that is running on a remote computer. You just don't realize it. They have generally a user interface that keeps the actual computing hidden from you. Those are applications. YouTube is a video application. I mean, you can actually go up and do actual editing. In fact, we saw it last month on doing the um, voiceovers. The uh, I can't remember the, the uh, fake, deep fake. Those are all online applications. Now, where do you use those a lot? Well, when you need a lot of computing power, the desktop can't give you that. You actually feed the data in, it does it remotely, and then gives you back the results. Completely transparent to you. You don't really know where that computer is, nor do you care. It does bring up some security issues. And once again, I'm going to state this. Please, 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 if you get an email or a text message, Asking you to go up and verify anything. Don't follow those links. They're a scam. Now, I just got an email in from American Express saying I needed to go up and verify data. The message went to great lengths to prove what was one A from American Express giving me information only they knew, and telling me that I should go to the site through my normal means. Don't use any links in this email, which they didn't have. I went up and checked the sender. Sender was American Express. Now, scammers are getting better and better at faking this. So just remember, if it comes via email, don't follow a link to verify information. If you follow, if you go tap a link in an email message or a text message, and it takes you to a site asking you to log in, don't quit that page and go back in how you normally go to your bank site, Facebook, whatever. If you can get two-factor authentication. Please use that. Now, what's two-factor authentication? I go up to Facebook, go to log in. It sends me a text message with a passcode to get in. Fine. That way, if somebody tries to get into my account or tries to change my password, they can't because they don't have my phone number. They can't get that passcode. I can't tell you how many times somebody's tried to hack into my Facebook account and I have two-factor authentication turned on and they can't. It happens at least twice weekly. So wherever I can get two-factor authentication, which more and more are doing, I use it. I use Face ID on my phone saying, hey, I only want logins through Face ID because they can't fake that one. 15 years ago, I guess about that, on Facebook, I get a message on Facebook from a very good friend of mine saying, help, I'm stuck in London. I need money. Can you please help me? And I thought, 
Jeez, I, you know. So I was getting ready to send her money. Texted her back. Asking her some questions. And I wasn't getting any responses. So I emailed her. And she said, she, she called me. She said, John, I'm not in London. I don't know what you're talking about. That's when we found out her Facebook account had gotten hacked into. Um, another thing, and if you get this one, oh, this is great. Um, beware of phishing exercises. You get an email from someone who shows you your login and password for a particular account saying, I have hacked into your computer. Here's how I can prove it. Here's your login and password. I found, you know, I have littered the internet with pornographic material about you. If you don't pay me, this is what I'm going to do. That is a result of a phishing exercise. You've gone in at some point to a bogus site and entered your login and password. Good friend of mine called me up in a panic. He'd gotten one of these. It was his legitimate password. And he said, What am I going to do? You know, what do I. It's, we went up, and fortunately, that combination he only had in about four places. Three of them he never even visited anymore. The one that was significant, we went up and changed the password. He says, well, what do I do now? Do I have to notify everybody? I said, you don't have to do a thing. What they're trying to get you to do, since you write down there where it says send you money through Bitcoin, that's what they're trying to get you to do. Don't send anybody ransomware. Okay? Before you pay anybody on an email message about anything, call me. So far, I have saved members close to $10,000 in Bogus scams. Telephone scams. No, no one is breaking into your computer. No, your computer is not affected. No, they can't tell that remotely. Especially if the person at the other end has a deep Indian or Pakistani accent. Don't believe it. No, the IRS is not going to confiscate it through the telephone. They don't do that. No, the Cochise County Sheriff's Department. Is not going to come and uh, take everything away. These are all scams that have happened. Okay, um, so just remember that. So let's move on. Okay, cloud computing. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And here's what we've got. Um, we have the iCloud Drive by me, OneDrive by Mike, Google Drive by Carolyn. And then we're going to have a short discussion period. And then we're going to go into backup strategies. Uh, one of them is going to be Backblaze, Dropbox, and discussion on cloud services. Okay. So why don't we get started and let's go into iCloud Drive. Okay. In this presentation, um, by the way, if you start to see the background moving, it is not. You. You see it? Okay. That is a new animated backgrounds they put in the Keynote. I just want to make sure that, that somebody says, oh my God, I, you're cracking up. Okay. Yeah, isn't that cool? Especially when we're talking about the iCloud. Okay. The I, iCloud, think of it as a virtual drive. It's available on all Apple devices. It is a virtual drive. It's accessible anywhere you have internet. You do not have to be an Apple owner in order to use it. Now, to get it, all of its services, yes. But there's a lot you can do without an Apple device. Services like what? You'll see. It's coming. It syncs with all of your Apple devices. So this allows you to have all of your passwords available on all of your devices without you doing anything. All of your contacts available without you having to do anything. 
uh, all of your messages on all your devices, your text messages, without you having to do anything. All of your photos. If you take photos, if you edit photos on your laptop, or your desktop, it'll show up on your uh, iPhone. If you take pictures of your iPhone, it'll automatically show up on your desktop. Plus a lot more. How much does it cost? Well, this is where it gets interesting. You get it free with an Apple ID. How much is an Apple ID? It's free. Anyone with an email address, or actually anyone, because if you don't have an email address, if you sign up for the iCloud, you actually end up with an email address and an email account with the iCloud. It's free. And you get the five gigabytes of storage free. Absolutely free. And it gives you access to the iWorks applications, which is pages for word processing, numbers for spreadsheets, Keynote for presentations, and photos for photography. But if you need more, you can get iCloud Plus. Now, iCloud Plus, you get 50 gigabytes of storage. Okay, that's not a bad amount of storage. Plus, you get iCloud Privacy Relay Beta, which means it hides your IP address from anybody on the Internet. Also, you have Hide My Email, which means it gives a fictitious email address that it links to your email address so that they can't send you bogus emails. You can have a customized email domain. Let's say you decide to go out and buy your last name, let's say smith.us. That's your domain. Well, ordinarily, you'd have to go up to a company and get an email account to use that for email. With iCloud Plus, you just go up and link that domain to the cloud and you start getting email right to that address for free. Well, actually, for the cost of an iPod Plus, which, by the way, starts at $0.99 cents a month or $12 a year. Believe me, that is a lot cheaper than the alternatives. Right now, and I'm getting ready to switch, Buno.us is costing me $300 a year. $120 a year, $300 a year, I get a lot more. That's why I'm switching. Okay, you also get HomeKit video support for cameras, and you can share everything with up to five family members. And that's for a dollar a month. That's not bad. Well, the next tier is $2.99 a month. Yes, I know, because I didn't change it on this slide. It's two different slides. And I'm not going to bother changing on this one. Okay. So, now the next tier up is uh, two terabytes for $10 a month. And that is cheap for two terabytes of data. And you get basically everything we talked about, but more storage. Now, don't forget, you get everything that we started the first one. These are additional. So let's go in now and find out. We're going to take a look at first on the Macintosh. The iCloud settings on the Mac OS are found in your settings panel under system preferences. And then come over here where it says the ID, Apple ID. And inside of there, you'll see this menu under iCloud right here for the, all the applications that use the iCloud and you can scroll down and turn these on and off if you turn it off then you will not be able to share anything with anyone else except on your computer but of note is down here where it says iCloud storage come over here to manage and you can see all the applications and how much space they're using in the cloud and we're going to go down here 
because I have some applications I no longer use, such as Ballistic Baseball. I don't even remember that one. I'm going to delete all the files on that. An NBA arcade game. And I don't even recognize that one. But you can see what you can do. But you have to be very careful when you do this because you are deleting files. And that's how you access the information for uh, Mac OS, for the iCloud storage. Here's your storage. Tells you how much you have, how much is available. And you came over. These are two new options, private relay and hide my email. Um, you have to have the latest um, iOS, I mean, latest Mac OS to get that. And our, let's go take a look at the options under iCloud Drive. Here are the apps that can store, and you can turn this on and off if you don't want them storing to the outside world. Before we go on to iOS, there's something I forgot to mention when I made that video that is the most important thing about the Mac and all the iOS devices is that you can turn on desktop and documents. What that does is every Mac has got a desktop folder and a documents folder. When you turn that on, that is automatically replicated in the cloud. Automatically backs up those two folders. So whatever you have on your desktop or in the documents folder is automatically sent to the cloud. And you can turn on movies, music, and um, photos, those three other folders. So they're automatically sunk. Now what this gives you is automatic cloud backup without you having to do a thing. Nothing else. Also that means that your documents folder and your desktop are available on every iOS device you own. Plus it's available through a web browser on any computer you can get to. Windows, Linux, Unix, whatever. If it's got a web browser, you can get to those folders. Now, I, for, I forgot to mention that when I cut the video, and that's the most important thing about it, is it's automatically done for you. You don't have to do a thing. And I use that feature all the time. And it's an option under iCloud. That you turn on desktop and documents. And when you do that, you just sit back. Now, when you do these, remember, you are using bandwidth and speed. So if you have a documents folder that is a terabyte in size, it's going to have to send up a terabyte of data to get it up there. Now, once it gets up there, it only has to send up changes. But if your data plan only gives you 100 gigabytes of data total and you're trying to send up a terabyte, guess what? You're going to get charged for 900 gigabytes of data. You have to think about that. I back up to the cloud. I have three, four terabyte drives that are 50% full. That is eight terabytes of data that I had to upload to the cloud to get it up there. That's when Cox went totally ballistic on me. That's why I have an unlimited data plan. Okay, now we're going to take a look and see how to get the iCloud services on your iPhone. I won't bother about the applications because all the applications um, on your iPhone have been there. You know how to use them. But we're going to go down to settings. 
And in settings, you see your name and Apple ID. Click on that and come down to iCloud. Click on iCloud and you see your storage. You can manage your storage just like we saw before. Clicking on that brings up this screen. It shows what is being used up. We go back up and these are all the applications that are using the cloud on your iPhone and you can turn them on and off so you come back here now the one place that's a little bit different we're gonna go into is we're gonna come back to the desktop and we're gonna go down to and take a look at an application called files and on your iPhone this is how you get to the documents that you have on your computer and it would be the same way with the iPad but here you go all the ones we took and looked at before right here and this is how you can access them now if you're going to the applications it automatically goes into the folder in the cloud for pages for keynote so that's already there you don't have to worry about that if you want to get other ones to open up in different applications you go through files and that's it for the iCloud on the iPhone. Now let's go in and take a look at, on a browser, what you get with the iCloud. Now remember, this is for anybody that has access to the web. Now let's see how to access the iCloud and its functionality from a web browser. So we're going to enter in iCloud.com. And this brings us into an Apple ID login page but it's just regular login and here I have access to mail now remember I can do this on any computer not just an Apple computer or an Apple device mail contacts my calendar photos iCloud Drive we'll get back to that all my notes my reminders pages so wherever I go I can get access to all of this and if I go into iCloud Drive I have access to all the files that I have placed in my documents or my desktop that I can get to them. Now we can go back to and access my other applications this way, but let's take a look at account settings and see what we have available there. Here I have all my devices shown that I've registered with my Apple ID. I can manage my ID, set up the language I want, time zone, storage, how much storage I'm using. I can use hide my email, which gives out a fake email. Here you can see ones that I've used, and it's being forwarded to this address or one of my other addresses, so they don't get my actual address, and I can see where it's coming from custom email domain and we'll have more on that later but that allows you to use like my buno.us I can use that through the iCloud and not have to pay extra and these who are part of my family share in here and then I can come over to my login information I can get help I can sign out I can move to other applications and that's iCloud through a web browser and now I'm going to log out. So that's the three ways to use the iCloud services. Now on your phone you have, now the mail that I showed in the cloud is your iCloud mail. So if you have other mail accounts, you cannot link that to the iCloud account like you can on your laptop or on your phone. Um, but you have access to mail on all devices, pages, numbers, keynote, reminders, contacts, find my, which is a godsend. Air tags and find my is the greatest invention since sliced bread. I can't tell you how many times I've, oh, let me get a prime example. Jane left her purse someplace. 
We didn't know where. She had not bothered to put the air tag in it that I told her. Fortunately, her phone was in her purse. This was a brand new purse she had just bought. So I went up to find my and said, son of a gun, I know where it is. And we went and somebody had turned the purse in and it was waiting there for us. But we could have tracked it anywhere in the world. She now has an air tag in her purse and it's never coming out. Uh, that's what I like about um, at least United, that on the United app you can track your luggage and so you know exactly where it was the last time it was scanned. And it scans it constantly. Like when it puts, goes onto the plane, it's been scanned. When it comes off of the plane, when it goes into the delivery area. But I still put an air tag in my suitcase. So I know where it is. Um, but like one day I was shopping at Safeway. I put my phone in the shopping cart. I put the groceries in the car and drove away with my phone still in the shopping cart. I got out of the Safeway parking lot, was up at um, Wilcox in Coronado, and my watch went berserk. <laughs> I mean, a, alarms going off, and I looked at it and it said, you've left your wallet back at Safeway. No. Yes, that's exactly what it said. You left your wallet at this location, Safeway. So I whipped the car around, went back in the Safeway parking lot, went back up to where I had parked, and there in the rack of, was my phone, still sitting there. Okay, any other questions? Okay. No questions? We're gonna go back to Mike's presentation on OneDrive. Now, OneDrive is very similar, but it has different services. So we're talking about software as a service, while OneDrive is storage like iCloud. It provides completely different services to the end user. So let's go up. OneDrive, while they both generically are cloud drive services, uh, functionality, that the services provided are completely different. Like OneDrive does not include spreadsheet and word processing for free. You have to buy it separate. Now, both of them are compatible with OneDrive. As a matter of fact, they almost force you to use OneDrive. But it doesn't come free with it. But let's take a look at before we'll discuss it after we see what Mike has to say. My name is Mike McLean. And today we're going to do a brief overview of the Microsoft OneDrive cloud storage service. The requirements for Microsoft OneDrive are that you must have a Microsoft account. And if you don't already have one, you can get that at account.microsoft.com. That does include 5 gigabytes of free storage, and you can upgrade to 100 gigabytes of storage for $1.99 a month or $19.99 per year. A couple of other alternatives is you can sign up for OneDrive for Business that provides one terabyte of storage per user and plans for that start at $5 a month per user. Or you could get a Microsoft 365 personal subscription that provides one terabyte of storage at $6.99 per month or $69.99 per year. Or you can get a Microsoft 365 family subscription which provides one terabyte storage for each of up to six family members, and that's $9.99 per month or $99.99 per year. And now let's take a look and see how Microsoft OneDrive works. If you have Windows 10 or above, you very likely already have OneDrive installed in your system. If not, it can be downloaded from Microsoft. You'll see it on your system tray as the small cloud icon. If I hover over it, it says OneDrive Personal Up to Date. If you do have to install it the first time, then it will run you through a small setup. Let's take a look at the configuration. If I, if I click on this once, it brings up this control screen. First, let's look at the configuration menu where I'm going to go into Settings 
at the little gear in the upper right and see what that's got for me. It has several options. I'm going to look at settings. And that brings up a settings dialog tab. The first thing it tells me is that my account is tied to my personal email address and how much of my storage I'm actually using. It also gives me the opportunity to unlink this PC from the cloud service. It allows me to choose which folders are available on this PC. And these are the folders that I have available from Microsoft OneDrive that I can get to from this PC. And it has an option for setting a timeout for the personal vault. The personal vault is a special folder that OneDrive has on your system. It is a encrypted folder that uses multi-factor authentication in order to protect itself. The idea is that even if someone hacks into your Microsoft account and can get to your folders, you can have your very sensitive information in the personal vault and they still won't be able to get to it. What Microsoft had in mind for this was things like perhaps a digital copy of your passport, uh, property, de uh, property deeds, a wedding certificate, things along these lines. The thing to remember about the personal vault, though, is that anything that's placed into it is not synced automatically. So this is really for archival purposes. Looking at the other tabs available in this dialog box, I have the settings tab, which mostly consists of different notification check boxes. But the one thing I'm really interested in is this is where I could tell whether or not to start OneDrive automatically when I start up Windows. The other thing we're really interested in is where it says File on Demand. Save space and download files as you use them. The thing to remember is that up until the most recent iteration of OneDrive, OneDrive was PC-centric. That has changed in the most recent iteration. Now it is cloud-centric. It expects you that you're going to be using your files mostly in the cloud and not need them that much on your local PC. So in order to make that more efficient, file on demand indicates that the files will be saved automatically in the cloud and it will only, only be downloaded to your local PC when you want to work on it. So then uh, you don't have to have them on any of your local, uh, multiple devices, your laptop, your desktop, your phone. It'll just be up in the cloud and it'll be downloaded as needed. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. Other options that are available to me are backup. I can automatically backup certain folders to OneDrive if I like. If I go to Manage Backup, here are the folders that will do by default. Desktop, Documents, and Pictures. I can also set it to automatically save photos and videos to OneDrive as I upload them to my PC. And I can set it to automatically save screenshots that I capture to OneDrive. The other tabs aren't all that vital to us today. Network is essentially if you're on a metered network. Office is if you want to do collaboration with others uh, using OneDrive. This allows you to do that using Office applications to sync files that I open and gives you an option for uh, dealing with sync conflicts. This is actually a subject for a whole other topic on collaboration. And the About tab gives you with some good information. So that is the Setup tab. I'm going to cancel out of this and go back to my OneCloud Sync and click on that. And you can see that it indicates all the different files I've looked at recently. I'm going to open the folder and see what I've got. This is the folder for all the files that are on my local PC. And you'll notice I have several icons here under status that indicate different things. The cloud icon indicates that these are the files that are residing on the cloud. They're not on my local PC at this time. I haven't worked on them. The green circle with the green check mark in it is interesting. That indicates that there is a file that I've been working on locally. I downloaded it from the cloud automatically to do work on it. Here is the thing you need to remember about this. As I've worked on it, it's going to stay on my local PC for the time being. Except this has the possibility of being a temporary file. 
It's an actual file, don't get me wrong, it's not a .tmp file like you see for Windows. But as far as Windows is concerned, it doesn't need to keep it here. If I were to run disk cleanup, then Windows would treat this like a temporary file and delete my local copies because it knows I have master copies up on the cloud server. If I want to change that, I can right click on a file or a folder and I can choose always keep on this device. And if I choose that, it goes through and you can see that it just changed all of these to a green circle with a check mark. Now, these are all permanently on my device. They do not treat them as ephemeral. And of course, you'll see I have the little double arrows here indicating that I've changed something locally. It has not synced up to the cloud yet. And finally, I have the icon here of a little guy indicating that I have actually shared uh, these files or a file in here with someone else. So I was collaborating with somebody else on some of these files earlier. So these are the files that are local to me. Now here is one issue though that could come up. In order to save a file onto OneDrive, I need to bring it in to these folders. These folders exist on my C drive. OneDrive automatically installs on my C drive under my username and a OneDrive folder. So in order to work on a file, I need to bring it in here. That puts it on my C drive. Well, what happens if I have an external hard drive that has like, shall we say, 500 gigabytes of photos that I'd like to back up to OneDrive? I have a one terabyte OneDrive. That's no problem. I can do that. However, my C drive is only 256 gigabytes because it's an SSD drive. It's used mostly for boot and not for sharing. So what do I do about that? There is a workaround here. I'm going to close this for the moment. And I'm going to open up my OneDrive thing here again. And you can see that I told it to save all those files. It's happily downloading them all, them now, all now. I can go to View Online here in the center. And this gives me my cloud server view of all the files I have. And you'll see up here, I actually have an upload button. So I can use this to upload files directly from my external hard drive to the cloud and bypass the C drive. Here's the caveat about that, however. If I do this, the files I upload this way will not be synced. If I change them on my external hard drive, they will not be changed here. Only the files that are on the C drive are synced. So that's something to be aware of. There is one other option or thing to be aware of. And that is, I'm going to bring up my one folder again. You'll see my documents folder here. Be aware that this documents folder exists under my OneDrive folder. This is not the same as the Windows documents folder that I have available in Windows. So for example, if I open this, here are my documents folders. If I actually open my Windows File Explorer and go to documents, I see these are not the same. So that tends to confuse some people, so be aware of that that the Windows document folder and the OneDrive document folder are not necessarily the same thing. Well, this concludes the brief overview of Microsoft OneDrive. I'm okay, thank you very much, Mike. And now we're going to look at one of the third things. Carolyn's going to show us about Google Drive. Now, Google Drive is kind of a hybrid between the iCloud and OneDrive. And I'll tell you right now, you either love it or you hate it. 
Um, I know that I personally don't like a lot of the Google applications like Google Write. I cannot get that to do anything I want it to do. Other people love it. It's one of the ones that we use for collaboration at work. So let's take a look at what Carolyn has to say. Today, our group's topic is cloud drives, and I am the one who is going to do the cloud, the Google Drive out of the cloud drives. And so first thing I'm going to do is share my screen. Now, to get to a Google Drive, it's free. Anybody can get to it. If you have a computer that you can get to Google, you can get to all the Google applications. And to do that, you go to google.com, and then you go to this little button over here with the nine dots on it, and here are all the applications in Google. The big advantage of Google is all of these are free. Another advantage of it is they are free and collaboration is really really good as far as i'm concerned it's the best one for collaboration here are the most commonly ones used gmail gmail which is your everyday email calendar as you can see you can have a calendar and you can share your calendar with others there's google drive which is the main purpose of this presentation you have meet which is a video conferencing documents which is a word processor sheets which is a spreadsheet slide which is a presentation and chat just like if you chat on your phone so let's go to our actual google drive here we are is google drive and like any other kind of drive, Google Drive, you can make folders and you can see the folders here. I'm going to go into my MVCUG folder. And I've already created a document for today. I called it new name. Don't ask me why. That's just what I called it. Now, when I get into this document, I've also shared it out with Mike and he's in the other room and he's going to type on this document. So here I am typing. And there's Mike typing. He's typing. This. So when you're in this presentation and collaborating, you can see people typing while I see people typing. And anybody else who is shared on your document can type just like this, huh? you know. So that is how the collaboration part works. Now, it has to be somebody you have shared the document with. And how do you do that? Is you go up here to the file and you go to share. And as you can see, I've shared this with other people already. I've got it shared with my own account, or I'm the owner actually. I've shared it with Barry. He probably doesn't know this, but I have. I've shared it with one of my non-Google accounts. I've shared it with John, and I've shared it with Mike's Google account. They say, as you can see, I've listed um, emails in here that are not Google emails. And they say, those are they, that you don't really need a Google account. But in my experience, you do. Because how do you get to a Google Drive unless you have a Google account? So that is how the Google account works. The disadvantage to these, though, that I always find is it's not real easy to share. Like, say, I, here's my Google Drive, and here is the drive on my computer, my drive. Now, if I was trying to take, I was trying to take, like, say, this and bring it, as you can see, it will not leave the window. I can share it to other folders in Google, but I cannot share it out. Really, I can, but I can't do it by drag and drop. 
But what I can do is I can right click on it and then I can say, actually, I want to do a different one. If I right click on it and I say download, download down right here. I say download. As you can see, it actually brings it up as a Word document. It, when I try to download it to my hard drive, it's going to bring it into my hard drive as a Word document. Let's do that again. I'm going to do one that's not a Word document to start out with. OK, here's one that I just did. And if I say download, as you can see, it's converting it to Excel. It'll bring it up and you save it as an Excel document. So the only way you can share it to another one is to convert it to a document that has an application that is on your computer. However, what you can do is you can take something from your hard drive and you can bring it into Google Drive. Let's see. See, I could take this and I can, it'll copy it into Google Drive. And that way you could, but so drag and drop only works one way. And that's one of the things I don't like about this. And now that I actually have that one that I just put into Google Drive. When it's in Google Drive, you'll see it converts it back into the Gmail version of Word. It doesn't bring it up as a Word version, even though I brought it in as a Word version. So you can't, the document's going to change going back and forth, and you can lose something in the translation. And that's one of the things I don't like about it. Like I said, I really, really do love the collaboration, and the collaboration works great. So if you want to collaborate, Google Drive is the way to go. If you want to do productivity, I would use one of the other cloud drives we've talked about today if you want to use cloud, a cloud drive. So that is my presentation of Google Drive. Okay. By the way, I've, it, this is giving me topics for next year. Um, one on collaboration, going in and showing how each one does collaboration because they're dramatically different. Oh, they are. <laughs> um, another one on using Dropbox. Complete, because I didn't, I just covered Dropbox from the backup. And I just realized, he's sitting here, I said, geez, I never showed how Dropbox works. Because it's very much like documents. And I don't know if one, in fact, this is OneDrive. When you save a document to OneDrive, does it automatically put it in the cloud, or is it on your computer also? Depends on how you uh, have it set up. Uh, when I use Word, oh, everything when you do Microsoft 365, it wants OneDrive. Everything will go to OneDrive by default. Yes. Because see, one of the unique things about using the iCloud is that when I save a document to the iCloud, that it is on my computer first, then it uploads it to the cloud. So I always have a copy on my computer. Always. Actually, one thing that OneDrive is doing, or that Microsoft 365 does, that is driving me crazy, is I have automatic save turned on, which means that every time I do anything, it'll automatically save it. I don't get a save as. So when I first create a document, it happily saves it as document one. And then later on, I'll have to, to rename it. I have to go in, save a copy, save it as something else, and go back and delete document one. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay, because Apple does it a lot differently. It creates it untitled. Right. 
and as soon as you go to save it, it comes up and says, give me a name. And that's the way Microsoft used yeah. to do it. Yeah. Okay, now the next one we're going to do, now that we're talking about the services, and we're going to be getting more of this because there's a lot of things you can do with this. Um, one of my good friends planned his mother and father's 50th wedding anniversary using collaboration documents with his brothers and sisters. I was the best man at their wedding. And so I was part of the collaboration. They had no clue what was going on. And part of it was, is that I did a video, congratulate him, you know, on the, and I uploaded it to his cloud account. He had it, he did his editing through YouTube, and it was seamless as what was going on. And because they were asking me, since none of them were there for the wedding, they didn't know what happened there. Okay. Um, of course, they weren't there at the wedding. Um, <laughs> they, none of them have been born yet. Um, the, what they didn't know is that the, one of the comments the priest made is he never had a wedding which was run with a stopwatch. The wedding was supposed to start at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and damn it, as a best man, I made sure at, I was sitting there up at the altar with my watch, and at 1 o'clock I dropped my hand, and that's when the bride, they started walking in. Freaked the priest out. <laughs> He'd never seen anything like that. He says, weddings are always late. Not with me on board. Uh-uh. Um, it's one of the best weddings I've ever been to. We had so much fun. I barely remember the reception, though. All I remember is the reception had really good food. And it's the first time I'd ever seen anybody peel an orange with a knife. A chef's cut. Okay, now let's get into backup strategies. We're going to talk about two backup strategies using the cloud. Now, understand that iCloud automatically backs up certain things. So it's a backup strategy. So if you don't have any external drives connected to your laptop, then you're basically being backed up for most of what you have, except for your applications folder. doesn't get backed up automatically to the cloud. Your documents and your desktop. Now, the reason for that, the iCloud strategy, is you can always recreate your applications folder easily. It's the documents that are volatile. So that's why it opts for backing up the documents folder so you don't waste space on something you can recreate. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that, but it's a good strategy. Okay, so let's go and take a look at what I use is Backblaze. It's a back... Backblaze is a backup utility that's cloud-based which allows you to back up one or more drives to the cloud. Um, when you go to backblaze.com, go over to personal backup, and you can come down here and you see an overview, and you can go through these things. But let's take a look at the comparison, because this will tell us the price. And they show you a comparison between Backblaze, which is $70 a year, Carbonite, which is another very popular backup program, Crash Plan and iDrive. And this gives you all the things that Backblaze does for the amount of money. Now the important thing is, is you know, how do we make backups and how do we restore? Well, I'm gonna go sign into my account right now to show you what it looks like online. And you can see right here, this tells me my license, and I can access this because it's in the cloud. I can access from anywhere I can get to the internet and get to you restore files. I can view and restore files. And backup is designed, I mean, Backblaze is designed to only restore files, not drives. Um, you can download individual files. Um, you can uh, save files to B2 storage with additional pricing. Or... For $189, you can get a USB hard drive, which you can return to them for a refund. 
if you have to do an entire drive. But you can get to all of your files, you can share it, you can locate your computer if you want to know where it is, if it's been stolen. So this is what you can get for your personal account with Backblaze. But let's take a look at what we can get when we go to backup our drives. Come over to System Preferences, and after you install it, there's a Backblaze Backup. And this is the panel that you get. You can also get it through the menu panel. Um, go over to Settings, and this shows you your device, the performance, how fast it is, the schedule when you want to have it done, exclusions, files you don't want backed up, security, to any security encryption key which you get from them, reports on the backup that's gone. Go back to settings, and here we can say when it has, something has been backed up, but most importantly is right down here, as we can tell what drives we want backed up and not backed up. It will not let you back up a time machine drive, but you can go from any any of your drives, you must do your internal hard drive. And you can also inherit a backup state. What this is, is if you've had to restart your computer or you've got a new computer, or you've had to reinstall the operating system, you can go and get up the last backup state and restore it, which is a nice feature. And that pretty much is Backblaze. It's $70 a year. Now, the big disadvantage of Backblaze is that it uses up a lot of bandwidth depending upon how many drives. In my case, I'm backing up m multiple terabytes, about 15 terabytes. So I have to have a lot of bandwidth in order to get to it so I have unlimited. But that's a major disadvantage. Restoring is fairly simple and straightforward. So that's Backblaze. Okay, one of the things I forgot to mention, it's amazing what you realize that you didn't say as you're watching it, is that restoring files is a bit slow in Backblaze. It can take half a day to get a file back, depending upon its size. I've had to use Backblaze to restore one full drive, which I've, after... I had sent away for it. I realized I didn't need to do it. The drive was not corrupted. Um, it just had not been plugged in correctly. The other one is a single files. In my case, the single files are huge video files. And those can take a long time. Small files, and by a small file, I mean anything under 10 gigabytes is small. And when you get over 100 gigabytes in file size, that becomes large. And this particular one that I was trying to download was 360 gigabytes. That took over a half day. Other than that, Backblaze is, is good. It's easy to use. It's reasonably priced. And it's very reliable. Now, one thing I didn't mention about the encrypted, why would I care about encryption? Well, in theory, If you have sensitive data that you want to make sure cannot be read, then you would encrypt it. Such as if you have a file that has all your credit card numbers in it, that is not, you're not using either Dashlane or 1Password that does encrypt it. You just have a plain text file one with all your passwords, then yeah, you better probably encrypt the backup to the cloud because in theory, somebody could get in and read it. Has this ever happened? So far, no. There's no case that I'm aware of that's ever happened. <clears throat> so the next one we're going to take a look at is Dropbox, which just recently has come up with a backup strategy.
Dropbox also has a backup strategy to the cloud. Now to use that one you first have to download the Dropbox app and it's available in the App Store on the Macintosh. It's also available for Windows. Um, and after you install it, it's available as a menu option. Here's the icon for it right here. You click on that and to set the backup, you go to your personal icon, go to preferences, and in preferences you click on backup, and then you get this uh, dialog box right here, and you hit manage backups, and then you click on get started, and it shows what it, basically you can set up, you can add folders, subtract folders, the default is the same exact ones you get off the iCloud for nothing. Now, in order to get a decent aspect out of this, and we I, first I want to show you, you can add folders. These are the only folders you can add right now. If we go to Setup, it shows you the prices to get additional space. Because without the additional space, you can't get anything except for the very basics off of your system folders. And as you can see, it's um, $12 a month, which is pretty much, I know that's for Dropbox Plus. For Dropbox Backup, it's $6 a month, but it only allows you to back up one computer and one external drive, regardless of size. To get more than that, you have to go to the $12 a month. For my money, I think Backblaze is a better deal to go. So that's what Dropbox gives you. What I didn't cover is how to use Dropbox on that, just to back up strategies. To me, Dropbox is too expensive. $12 a month versus, um, that'd be $140 a year versus $70 with Backblaze. Don't think it's worth it. Um, it is faster. The, ba the Dropbox backup is faster. I tried it out on the internal drives, the free one, and it is faster. Um, so that is the discussion on cloud services, what you can get. It's come a long way from the old days of sitting in front of a console with the mainframe in the background and you could just type in messages or you had to submit data one line at a time to now where you have full computing capability from your laptop you can get the documents easily back up so the cloud is becoming a very, very important part of our computing lives. But more importantly, it's still very transparent. Most of the time you have no idea you're using the cloud. And generally speaking, that's the way it should be. Okay, next month, we're going to be talking about um, the future.